Listen, a lot of people underestimate everything that goes into making a movie. Like there are so many moving parts that if one person from the credits decides to go missing, it can ruin the entire production. There's all the work in pre-pro, the actual days on set, the editing, the marketing, and the scariest part of it all, wondering if people are gonna go see it. So here comes this new movie that Universal really wanted to turn into a franchise and they marketed so much that it felt like those trailers were playing for freaking two years and then it comes out and no one shows up. We're talking about a movie with an estimated budget of $150 million and it made $7 million in its opening weekend. And for those who know the box office numbers game, like it, it's not like Billboard where they're magically gonna jump up in the coming weeks. Like. That, that's pretty much it. And I don't even know if that number includes the marketing budget, so I don't even know how deep into debt they are. Now, some people would blame the critic score for being the reason that no one showed up, but one, y'all hype up critics way too much, you know? You conveniently forget how the Transformers movies are all pooped on and people still go. Two, how Annihilation and other movies get rave reviews and they also still flop, so don't blame the critics. I don't know if it's just because most sci-fi films don't seem to attract a mass audience if they're already not part of a franchise, or because families didn't want to see Motorhomes on wheels, but I'm betting on it being the decision to go up against much bigger franchises that were having releases at the time. Either way, I decided to cough up the $25 in AMC Stubbs to see this in IMAX, but I can tell by the fans of the series who are watching it with us that even to them, some parts made absolutely no sense. Let me explain. So you may remember Mortal Engines back at one of your classic book fairs where you probably looked at it and said, hey, look, another Captain Underpants book. This is actually book one of four in a series called the Mortal Engines Quartet. On top of that, there's a whole prequel series that adds to the mythology. And what's crazy about it is that this was originally a more adult-oriented story full of politics, but since nobody would pick it up, Scholastic was like, yo, we'll take it, but... Y you gotta make it for kids. So not only did they strip down my man's story, right? They then stretch it out a bit with the prequels and then fail him with this movie. So I don't know, maybe with the next series, my man, or maybe not. Now, I don't think it's a complete disaster per se. You know, I'm a big believer on certain mediums and I really believe that this one would have been better as a mini series, you know, cause sometimes stories work better in a specific type of format. And I personally think that that would have been the best way to tell the story. We start off learning about the past, which is really our present, where this thing called the 60 minute war happened and it caused this huge disaster and pretty much America doesn't exist. In order to avoid all these day after tomorrow natural disasters that are happening on that side of the globe, this dude named Nicola decides to turn London and other cities that follow into a giant motorhome so they can escape the disaster because a hurricane can't hit you if it can't catch you. Other cities then start using this technology and put their towns on wheels, but London pretty much is the monster truck that consumes all of the other little cities in order to get their resources. At the same time, there's another settlement in Asia known as the Anti-Traction League. I'm not even kidding about all of this. They built a wall in order to keep those weirdos out who are living in mobile cities because they just want to live on land. Even though they kind of have a couple of mobile cities of their own. Now, I've seen movies like Snowpiercer that have done similar concepts of people living in mobile vehicles. You know, I've also seen 8 Mile where they live in an RV. But damn, did this movie get all the looks down and then forgot to cover how everything else works. Like obviously just basing it off the marketing they gave, they wanted this to be the next big world building epic like Lord of the Rings, except... You know, for the extremely random times when it just turns into jokes. Like, I kid you not, there's a scene that happens in a museum where they stop the movie to refer to these old American deities, and then they show you two statues of the minions. And they didn't even show you Dave. Obviously, Universal owns the rights, so I guess that was just a play for them, but it's still so random. Like, they try really hard to press their message about our current times by referring to iPhones as ancient technology that made us dumb. There's a whole line about us in the present being so advanced and yet so dumb for having nuclear weapons. So, you know, if only more people went to go see Mortal Engines when it came out, might have just changed our society. Justin Longer plays the everyday Joe who works at the museum in London and he's friends with the head honcho's daughter and he actually rescues said dude when this mass vigilante comes in trying to kill him. This is for my mother. This it's also the actual editing in the movie. Like if you were to see this in the big screen, the, the ADR is so off 
it made Blueface sound like he was on beat. Yeah, so we learned that this little girl named Hester was raised by her mother, who was an archaeologist, but always had these flashbacks of Valentine coming over to visit like he was the milkman. Since Valentine is super obsessed with controlling the super weapon known as Medusa, you can tell that he's just waiting for Pandora to do all the work, and the moment she collects all of the devices he needs, he's just gonna dip like that bit in Buster Scruggs. So the moment Pandora finds the device, Valentine takes it, he offs her, slashes Hester's face, but she's able to escape since she's fast enough to rush the fields. That's why she's always been set on getting revenge for her mother, but again, this dude had to get in the way. He starts chasing her to the engine of the city where she decides to just let go. Ah! Oh, no! Valentine then comes in, and in order to thank his loyal servant for saving him, Within the first 30 minutes of this movie, both of the main characters are dead. Then it turns out they're alive. Now, I don't know how you survive falling out of a city that is also leaving like 20 yard trenches, but these two end up forming a bond over Twinkies, since you know those never get stale. I could use a Twinkie. They then get picked up by another moving city who they think is there to help them, but in reality, they're just putting them up on an auction. They're about to die for the second time in this movie when this unique little model comes in and shoots up the place. Now, Anna is this anti-tractionist intelligence agent, say that 10 times fast, who helps them escape in order to stop Valentine and his evil plan. She's living up in the Sky City, which gets attacked and destroyed by this dude. <laughs> and so, okay, let me get it. I'm aware that this was supposed to be one of many movies, right? So you can't stuff the whole story in one film, but like, bro, they skimmed over a lot with the lore of this movie. See, the way the movie presents these, I kid you not, robo zombies is so ridiculous. I thought we started watching another movie. There's this whole backstory in the books that expands on them. So after the 60 minute war, there were these empires battling each other across Europe, which at this point became a literal volcano maze. It's crazy. Crazier than that was that a group of them decided that the best way to win these wars was to build these creatures known as the Resurrected Men, or Stalkers, that consisted of grabbing dead bodies from the battlefields, wiring them up with what they called old tech, which brought them back to life with no emotions or memories, and thus they became these killing machines that they could upgrade with new weapons. So. Overlord super soldiers, but even more jacked up. The prequels then cover how they eventually want rights and all that jazz. They go as far as starting their own kind of like union known as the Lazarus Brigade. But in terms of Shrike, they didn't do this dude's story justice. This is a man who has a whole backstory of being an archaeologist, turned into a hitman when he gets reanimated. He lost his wife and kids, so when he finds Hester as a child, he adopts her. And in order to allow her to live forever the same way he does, he plans to turn her into a stalker as well. But then, but then she dips. Now, Stephen Lang couldn't get Cable, even though he did his own Photoshop, so I guess this was the next best robot, but his motivations made no sense. So you're telling me you love this girl so much that you want to turn her into a zombie so she can live forever, okay, but when she runs away, you just want to kill her? Obviously, he doesn't get to kill her, the box office did, and he realizes that the little Hester he raised has finally moved on and found somebody alive to love and so he just turns into dust. What's funny is that he does eventually come back later in the books when they re-resurrect him. It's something that they also do with Anna's body as they turn her into a stalker in order to bring her back as well. But it also got me thinking, did y'all know that in Game of Thrones, Lady Stark also comes back as a zombie assassin? Like. HBO, where did that storyline go? They make it to the mainland, which I believe was one of the biggest gambles. Like, obviously the movie is going with this effect of when you finally see colors in that last act, it's supposed to give you this very, you know, jarring effect, and, and they got it. It's just, boy, was there some bland imagery for the first two hours. Valentine starts weaving his way into the cathedral where he's storing the Medusa weapon, and since he's collected all the devices he needs, he's ready to fire it. Hester then decides to check the locket her mama left her for first time, and finds the crash drive they need to stop the weapon. However, Valentine's fired this bad boy twice already, so there's like more Asgardians than there are people left behind that wall. And then randomly, the movie turns into Star Wars. Tom gets his Han Solo on and becomes a pilot. They bust out with their not X-Wings to put out what isn't a Death Star. They fight off these troopers who never hit their target, and then they legit... They legit have an I am your father scene between these two. But I guess in order to not repeat that line and get sued, they convey that information by just staring at each other. So I myself went to go research it in the books and, yep, 
It's Star Wars. Anna sacrifices herself in order to defeat Valentine who gets squished. The civilians from the capital embrace the flatland as they get on it, and these two ride off into the sunset where they'll hopefully get an oil change. Or at least a remake. Thank you guys for checking out this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Like I say, I mean, there was a lot of money in production that went into this. I think the production design is great. There are times where it was a little bit too much uh, green screen that they didn't really, you know, key out the best and you notice it in IMAX. The ADR, like I said, bro, there was so much sinking errors in this, at least in the screen that I saw, which I want to say since it's, you know, measured for IMAX, that's the best quality you can see it in, but it should have been a mini series. I mean, look, look at HBO, look at even Hulu and Netflix are able to make big stuff there that's where they should have put it but boy did this movie lose a lot of money uh, i'm curious to know your thoughts if you liked it if you enjoyed it if you're a fan of the books that's like what i'm really interested in because a lot of the people who were in our theater who clearly were a fan of the books they were just shaking their head when they were walking out of it they felt disgrace but I'm curious to know your thoughts um i guess a little big thing to recap the last time i did one of these sort of like box office based ones was for um the billionaire boys club and i got a couple of comments like this talking about how i didn't cover how it made little to no money um i, I did but in, in case you missed it here's a clue if i didn't pay the price for the things we both know i did do i'm certainly not going to pay the price for the things i didn't do yeah, uh, I'm curious to know your thoughts. I know that some people have brought up the whole idea how the movie was practically Asia versus Europe, like London versus all of the minorities that were there. I, I don't see that as being a theme considering that at the end of it, if, if we're focusing on that, it's the American hard drive that ends up winning it all. So I don't really focus on that. I, I think that this, again, would have been a better miniseries. They wasted all this money out there. And I think Universal has another bomb with Marwin. So man, are they going to have to do a lot of stuff in 2019. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. And I'll send you a scholastic bookmark.